Major Lindsay and Africa presents Bouncing Back, conversations about resilience for lawyers. Welcome to Bouncing Back, Resilience for Lawyers. This podcast is brought to you by Major Lindsay in Africa, the global leader in legal search and consulting. I'm your host, Rebecca Glasser. I'm a managing director in the associate practice group at Major Lindsay in Africa. In this podcast, I speak to successful professionals about the hiccups, bumps, bruises, and setbacks they've experienced in their personal and professional lives. Ultimately, we learn how they bounce back to flourish. Today, my guest is my friend, Manita Rawat. She is the managing partner of Dwayne Morris's Silicon Valley office, and she's a member of the firm's intellectual property practice group. She's a registered patent attorney with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Manita has a technical background in applied mathematics with a concentration in computer science, aerospace engineering, and statistical analysis. Manita, like me, is a graduate of the University of Illinois College of Law. She's fluent in Hindi and speaks conversational German. She's a member of Dwayne Morris's Governing Partners Board and serves on its Diversity and Inclusion Committee. She, she has received numerous awards for her contributions to her community and the profession, including but not limited to the Silicon Valley Business Journal Women of Influence Award and the Best Under 40 Award from the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association. Manita, thank you for being my guest today. Well, thank you for having me, Rebecca. It's exciting to be on here with um, a former law school classmate. Absolutely, I'm excited as well. During the Great Recession, you were laid off from your law firm job. Tell me about that experience. Yeah, it was um, in the 2008-2009 uh, time frame. Uh, obviously, uh, we were, you know, we had a had an economy that was had declined substantially um, from the 90s um, and and even the early 2000s, and uh, law firms were heavily impacted at that time. And um, I, I was laid off along with uh, a few of my peers uh, at other law firms um, when the work had dried up at those firms. Definitely. I remember that time well, unfortunately. Um, for me <laughs> and the associates at our firm, we knew something was up because the partners started disappearing in the middle of the day. We learned after the fact that they were going to a conference room down the hall to conference about what they were going to do about what was going on. Um, was your experience a shock, uh, you know, or did you see it coming? No, I, I think it was, I think we all knew it was coming. Um, you know, I was a first year associate back in 2000, right, right at the end of 2005. And there was a, a substantial amount of work then. And you saw it readily decline. And, and by the time, you know, 2008, 2009 hit, we were as associates, I was, I was obviously a third, fourth year associate at the time. Uh, when that happened and and we saw the work substantially decline and hours go down. Um, so I knew something was going to happen. I, I just didn't know to the extent what that was going to be. Obviously, I, I got called in one day to the office managing partner's office and and um, was told that I was going to be given you know, uh, approximately three months uh, to find a new job, which I thought was very generous. Um, and definitely, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and so then it hit me and, and then I knew I had to do something. <laughs> right, exactly. Like take action. Like I've got a mortgage and student loans and I need to do something about this. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you, you have bounced back beautifully from that great recession firing. Uh, you are, you know, now in many ways 
at the pinnacle of your career. You're a partner at one of the biggest and most profitable law firms in the world, Dwayne Morris. The leaders of that firm thought it fit to make you the managing partner of a burgeoning, growing uh, office in Silicon Valley. You are one of the few female minority partners in the AMLA 100. And even in the sort of more rarefied era of being, you know, an office managing partner and the leader at an AMLA firm, uh, how did that happen uh, after bouncing back from uh, the Great Recession? Well, um, it's something I, I hadn't really thought about. I feel like the last, um, the the you know, the last decade has just flown by. Um, I will say, like anything that comes as a shock that may be, you know, a failure to a certain extent, there is a, there is a grieving period that I think one owes themselves, uh, yes. you know, whether it's, you know, eating a tub of ice cream <laughs> for a week and, and you You're know. You're speaking my language. <laughs> right, right. And, and, you know, we didn't have Netflix streaming back then, but you could, you know, watch a bunch of movies on your DVR that you had taped. Um, you know, you, you do that. And I think, you know, there, there was that period where I think everyone owes themselves after a breakup or after a major rejection or failure where you, you need that time to process what happened, especially when you're so young. I mean, at the time, I think I just turned 30 and, and, you know, relatively speaking, that was, you are very young at the time and, and, you know, that's, that's a major blow. Um, so I think you need that time to just kind of process what happened um, and and then, you know, just grieve for a little while and, and maybe have a pity party or whatever you want to call it. But but I, I say limit that to just just no more than a week. And I think then comes your planning about the future. And right. Uh, right. And and. You know, I, I think after that point, what I did was I, um, you know, reached out to recruiters like you um, and let them know what had happened and if they could help me find a new job and, you know, brushed up my resume and, um, you know, it, what, what was fortunate for me and I think a lot of uh, junior associates like me who had been laid off is that, you know, your, your third, fourth, fifth years out of law school, you're very marketable as an associate. Yes. And, yes. and yeah. And so, so I was, you know, my, my firm had given me three months to find a new job and I had found a new job within a month. So there wasn't really this, this gap in my resume. There wasn't this lack of, of receiving a paycheck. So I, I consider myself very fortunate. Yeah. Right. In that respect. Um, and I also, I, I read a book, uh, at the time, uh, it's called, we got fired and it's the best thing that ever happened to us by Harvey McKay. And I recommend that book to anyone you know, right now we're going through a pandemic and, and a, another recession and another economic uh, hit that I recommend anybody who has been laid off or down on their luck right now to read this book because it really inspired me. And I think that reading that book kind of set my next steps that really set the stage for my career to enable me to be where I'm at now. And in particular, it, it, this book goes through lots of famous people who had also been fired at some point in their career. And then what they did to bounce back and become very successful. And one particular person in this book that I remember that was who was discussed is Pat Mitchell. And Pat Mitchell, uh, for for those uh, who are listening who don't know her, she was the first woman president and CEO of PBS at the time. And she was actually working as a researcher and writer for Look Magazine when she was younger. 
And that magazine ended up having to lay her off because they were going out of business. And, you know, she, after that, you know, ended up becoming, you know, the first woman president and CEO of PBS. Um, and, and they had more stories like that of, of just famous people who, who bounced back. And I think, I think you need inspiration when you are knocked down like that. You need something that lets you know that this happens to everyone at some point in their career. They're going to have a setback. They're going to have something that may knock them off their feet. But as humans, we have the capacity to come back and move forward and thrive from that. We just can't stay knocked down. And I think that book really helped me. And I think what I really learned about that in the book kind of goes into this is when you've been fired or terminated or laid off, find out why and learn from that. And then do some steps to prevent that from happening again. Um, yes. In in my case, obviously, I, I learned that, you know, when you, as, as an associate, when you work for a partner and the partner no longer has work, you are out of luck as the associate because yes. you, you're kind of dependent on yes. work from from that partner. Um, and it struck me early. I mean, I was, I was fourth year associate at the time. It struck me early that, you know what, I'm going to be prepared for the next recession if and when that comes. Yes. Where I don't want to be yes. dependent on somebody else feeding me. And it yes. was at that point that I decided, you know, on my new platform, this new law firm that I'm going to, I'm going to build my own book of business um, while I was there. And I was really fortunate enough. Uh, I was working for a St. Louis based firm at the time to work under a partner who was an extraordinary entrepreneur. And I watched him and how he built his um, patent prosecution practice. And he, he had recognized, you know, my personality as being somewhat different from your traditional patent attorney. And, and he knew that I had some contacts. So he kind of pushed me in that direction. Like, you know, you can leverage your contacts into building your own book of business. And so I started there uh, with, with one particular client that I ended up pitching and then getting the work. Um, and what I didn't realize at the time was that client was looking at me as, hey, you know, here's this young associate Maybe if we, you know, have her be our outside counsel and she learns about our company, she may want to come work for us in house at some point. And that was their thinking. So, so it made me realize like you should be as a young uh, uh, attorney out there trying to market yourself because there are opportunities like that. Um, and obviously, you know, I started off with a very you know, with a small book of business, um, but then just grew it um, and it would keep growing. And, um, you know, that then it, my, my clients were starting to grow. I went from one client to three um, and, and, and then they were all out in California. So I, I needed to be at a firm that had a California office. So I came to my current firm. I came to Dwayne Morris at the time. I think I was a seventh or eighth year associate at the time. And I started in our Las Vegas office um, and, you know, just continuing to build the book of business. And eventually, you know, four years ago, I moved out here because the book had grown substantially at that point. And, and I wanted to grow it even more that it made sense to uh, be out in Silicon Valley where most of my clients are located. Um, and then two years ago, uh, became the managing partner of this office and, and now tasked to grow the office, um, which is, which is an exciting new chapter in my life. 
Um, but I, but I really learned that, you know, when I, after I got terminated and I came to the, the firm that I went to after that termination was a develop a really good skill set as a lawyer. And I, I was determined to be a good patent lawyer um, and, and make sure I got the appropriate training uh, to be a good patent lawyer and then be build my own book of business so that when the next recession hit, I was going to ensure I wouldn't be impacted again. And sure enough, you know, 2020, we were hit with a pandemic, you know, some work had slowed down. Uh, my work did not in fact, it grew uh, this year because you know, there was just so much work in the tech space out in Silicon Valley in response to the pandemic. So it just, um, it was good, but I'm glad that I started that base book of business back when I was a fourth year so that now, you know, being a fifth year partner, I had, you know, something that was more substantial and that could withstand uh, another recession. Yeah, and I mean, and kudos, and it's, you know, been a long time coming. I, it clearly took some patience. Uh, you know, this is a decade long, give or take, um, endeavor of yours and you, and you built something that um, is sustainable and has allowed you to have the kind of career that, you know, you can you can enjoy and um, have some you know a bit of a safety net and it's and it's and it's enviable. Um, what advice would you have for you know up and coming lawyers who are like okay yeah I get it I need to book a biz a book of business but you know they didn't teach me how to sell in law in law school they don't teach you that they didn't teach you know I don't have you know. I don't come from a long line of business people with impressive contacts that can put me in touch with their dad's cousin's dog walker who has his book of business and being a little facetious here. But, you know, some people sort of rely very heavily on parental or, you know, grandparent contacts or that sort of thing. Um, what advice would you have for someone who feels that the task of building a book, it just, just, just scares them? Yeah, and it and I will say it is scary, um, but there you one needs to try and just take the risk and put yourself out there and don't let um, anything be a limitation or barrier. Uh, I know, you know, just having gone through the law firm world. You know, you, you witness, as you mentioned, you know, people that have the contacts or had, you know, the family relationships. And I think, I think most of us see at law firms um, or even in law school, we went to school with children of lawyers, right? And, and, and then when they go to law school, you know, they get contacts because their dad was a lawyer and maybe their dad had a book of business that the dad is handing down. And, and I hear that a lot from from younger associates who say, well, I just, you know, I, I don't have a family of lawyers and the only people who have books are people who come from a family of lawyers because, you know, they had their family members hand it to them. And um, that's not always the case. Yes, that that is sometimes the case and, and certainly an advantage that people who may have had the family history of being in the legal profession be helpful to them. You know, I, I certainly did not come from a family of lawyers at all. I, my, my father is, is a college professor and my mom's a researcher um, at, at the university and they were in the academics, so they're not even in the business world. Um, and so I, I did not have that, but, but Here's what we all have, I think, as as you know, young law firm uh, associates, we have peers and colleagues, and you know, a lot of those peers are through relationships that we had in law school, right? Um, or it could be relationships that we had with our peer associates at law firms, and. Yep. You know, a lot of those guys end up going in house and they could be your point of contact and be somebody who could send you work as outside counsel. Um, you know, I, I think 
I think there's a little bit of luck to it as well. I know, I know uh, my clients that I have now came through, you know, meetings. Um, you know, I met one at a conference and I met another through a mutual lawyer friend and, you know, they, they were looking for an outside counsel who's a patent lawyer at the time and it ended up being a very good book. Um, but, you know, what we, again, what we all have in common is, is that peer group of, of people. And, and so I always, I always stress, be a good person, be a nice yes. person that, you know, I think, I think yes. that this profession and even in law school can harbor a very competitive environment, right? And yes. I, where, you know, maybe people aren't that nice to their peers because they're trying to get ahead. But here's what I learned is if you are nice, if you display kindness, if you just are authentic and genuine, people remember that. And I, I get, you know, calls from in-house attorneys all the time where, you know, it was somebody I, you know, was an associate with at, at one of the firms I was at, or, or maybe I went to law school with them and, and they reached out and they, they'll say, oh, you know, I see you're doing patent work. We have some issues at my company, you know, could you help us out? And so, you know, don't, don't be disheartened by the fact that you know, you may not have some family connection. I certainly didn't. That shouldn't negate you um, from having a book. It just, you know, putting yourself out there, meeting people, even just reaching out to old colleagues and, and law school classmates, that could be a starting point. The other thing I want to stress is that, you know, for women and diverse lawyers, it's a really great time because every, I can't think of a fortune 500 company that isn't having diversity as a platform for their company right now. And, and as an, an initiative right now. And, and with that, they want to work with women and diverse uh, attorney uh, outside counsel. So this is the perfect time to go to industry conferences, um, legal conferences where you can be in front of in-house attorneys um, because they are looking for uh, uh, women of color, they're looking for people of color, they're, they're looking for women uh, to work with and, and, and help out at, at a law firm. Yes, it's like strike while the iron's hot. This is, uh... A, a, a big driver for a lot of companies right now. And um, on the recruiting side of things, we are getting a lot of, it's sort of a drumbeat uh, that, you know, bring us diverse attorneys of all kinds um, kind of thing. And, you know, obviously you've got to be careful um, in terms of making sure your pool of um, candidates is diverse and not narrow and includes a little bit of everything. But um, there's definitely this sort of uh, drumbeat and it's a, it's, it's a, it's a wonderful time to take advantage of that if you're a young up and coming uh, attorney, for sure, definitely. Um, you have been very um, kind during this conversation to, you know, obviously give credit to mentors, obviously some good books, uh, you know, good fortune. Um, but I wanna come back to your own experiences and 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 talk about you know the fact that you are a resilient person um you know the person who eats ice cream for a week and then pulls himself up and says brushes themselves off and says okay i need to build a book of business um that that's not everyone right that's special and unique to you um and so i wanted to ask you know when you sort of reflect on all of this in your career and your life experiences, Manita, um, what experiences or influence in your past do you think helped to make you a resilient person? Um, I think what has helped me be a resilient person is that, um, you know, I'm a daughter of immigrants uh, and, and the first place we immigrated to uh, was Grand Forks, North Dakota. 
where obviously we stuck out <laughs> like a sore thumb. Yeah. You know, it was <laughs> blonde hair, blue eyed in, in Grand Forks, North Dakota. And here, here we were, this Indian immigrant family. And I, I think that, you know, obviously there, I, I, I can't recall any overt racism um, that we experienced, but, but I think there was implicit racism and implicit biases that we experienced. And I think when you experience that, and when you see something like that, you kind of have the mindset of, okay, this world is going to be different for me uh, and people who look like me um, and people who are in the similar boat, whether they are immigrants, whether they're people of color, whether, you know, they have gender differences than, than you're, than, than, you know, being, being a white man. Right. And, and, right. Um, and so you realize early on the privileges that, you know, a white man would have. Right. Um, yeah. and you see that because you, you get treated as a woman of color very differently early on. And yeah. I think having that awareness and that knowingness that, okay, I'm going to have to work harder. I'm going to have to, um, you know, accept challenges in a way that a white man with certain privileges, and by the way, just being a white man in itself is a privilege. Um, you know, right. I, it, I'm not going to have that. Um, and, and I think it was instilled in me by my immigrant parents in that, you know, uh, they recognized what was going on in, in the small town that we were living in and, um, instilled that sense of, okay, you know what, you're going to have to work 10 times harder. Uh, you're going to have to do better than everyone else in order to get the same recognition, right? And and that was instilled early on uh, in me, you know, for school, right? You're gonna have to do very well in school. You're gonna have to do, you know, you want, you just have to do better than everyone else. And I think that that has carried with me uh, throughout, you know, college, throughout law school, and then into my profession. I think, you know, I mean, there are law firm studies, right, of, of the implicit bias that goes on. And, you know, you will see, you know, the white male associates get staffed on things and, you know, the women and diverse attorneys do not, you know, the, the opportunities are not as prevalent. Um, yes. and, and so knowing that, I think early on, kind of sets the stage for, okay, there are going to be challenges and there, there are going to be lots of rejections throughout my life, but I can't succumb to them. I always have to yeah. get beyond them. I have to overcome them. And I think having that, the values that my immigrant parents instilled in me and just being different in, in a small town in, you know, small town America. And then, you know, and then we moved to Reno, Nevada when I was 10 years old, which, which wasn't that much different. Um, just slightly warmer, maybe. Yeah, just slightly <laughs> warmer. <laughs> you know, but, but very similar demographic. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, people, people could say, God, what an awful experience. You know, I, I know, I know, like, when I went to law school, a lot of the people of color in our law school class were from Chicago. And I would tell them about my upbringing in Grand Forks, North Dakota and Reno, Nevada. And they would just think, they would just say, it's so awful. And I, I didn't actually think it was, I thought it was actually a great experience in that. I, I think it made me who I am today, having had those experiences because I could witness the implicit biases early on in life so that when I yes. went to a law firm, I was prepared for that. Yeah. It, it wasn't yeah, a shock a, to me. Yeah. Right? It wasn't less a, shocking. 
Right. Right. It wasn't shocking. It was, oh, okay. Yeah. No, I know. I know this happens. Whereas I think yeah. it could be shocking for a lot of people who may not have experienced that before. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's just, um, I sort of had an epiphany as you were talking. It's almost as if you can almost look at it with an, a, a critical, almost sort of non-emotional eye. Not, not that you wouldn't be emotion, have emotions and be tweaked that, you know, you didn't get on a matter that you think you are the perfect person to be on, or, you know, when you see the implicit bias, it's not like that it, it doesn't sort of spark emotion and irritation and anger, let's say, um, perhaps hurt, but you could almost sort of take a step back and go, okay, yeah, I know what that is. I know what's happening right there. And then almost sort of problem solve your way around it, figure out a way to deal with it in a productive in a productive way because it's not you're like this is not the first time I this is not my first rodeo uh I have done this before I've seen this in a different form um and therefore it can sort of inform how you um strategically navigate your career going forward um that's that's helpful uh yeah definitely yeah yeah it was it was almost a a level of acceptance right um, yeah that this is the way the world is and we just have to navigate it. We can't get angry. We can't, you know, that's not going to solve anything. We can't, you know, scream at people. We can't, you know, we just accept it and we move yeah. forward from it, navigate. Yeah. Well, if you're in my, my way, I'm going to go under you, over you, around you. <laughs> right. <laughs> Maybe right. We have to, um, but I'm just going to deal with the consequences. Well, um, we've got a few more minutes left and I have a, Final question that I wanted to ask you, you touched on a lot of different things, but as we know, this past year has been really difficult for a lot of people, especially young, newly practicing attorneys. Um, many of them have been furloughed, laid off, faced pay cuts, uh, uncertainty about their hours and, and the future of their careers. And they're also experiencing upheaval in their personal lives if they've had a, um, a, a sick loved one, dealing with you know parents and all kinds of things. And, um, you know, obviously the millennials and Gen Xers, many of them were too young to be directly impacted by the Great Recession in the way that we were. And it's the first time in their adult lives that they're kind of dealing with this level of certainty in multiple different areas of their lives. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, if you had kind of some nuggets of advice about, because this is, you know, this is not something that's going to remedy tomorrow. I, I have a feeling there'll be some fallout for the next months and years to come it's it, what we didn't get here overnight and we're not going to be able to fix it you know economically and otherwise quickly um you know what are your thoughts uh for those individuals who are experiencing this for the first time i i would say um you know and, and it's actually there's lots of things i would say i mean it's interesting because i mentor a lot of associates at my firm and in, in, in the legal community out here in Silicon Valley and, and they've all, you know, expressed, you know, the the oh my gosh, what's going to happen? And and I've even talked to associates who have been laid off and, and they have until, you know, the end of December to find a new job. And I, you know, I always give them this this piece of advice is, you know, just have hope and faith that you know this is this will turn the tide will turn and uh you can't ever lose that faith i think if you if you lose the faith that that things will get better then it won't you you just have to endure it and stay positive and know that it's not the end of the world um you know, I think it's easier to say that now that I've already gone through this. And, and when I was laid off, it was, you know, more than a decade ago. But but I, I, I understand. I mean, I, I remember, you know, like I said, I, I, I think I ate ice cream every night for, for a week. <laughs> and I got laid off. And, and I did, ice cream I is my uh, drug of choice, too. I'm down right. with the ice cream. As a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And, and I didn't, would I have known back then that I would be in the position I am now? No, no, absolutely not. I would never have dreamed to be in the position I am now back then. Um, but, you know, what I did learn is that, you know, 
you need to control the things you can control. Yeah. And, yeah. and that is obviously getting back on your feet, getting a new job, learning from the mistakes that you made in your old job and, and, you know, mitigating those mistakes at your new job. And, and, you know, for me, it was okay. I'm going to build my own book of business and then striving for that. Um, you know, every successful person has had many rejections and failures. Um, and in fact, the most successful people probably have had the most number of failures um, and, and rejections. I, I think, you know, if you look at any ho famous Hollywood actor or actress, they can tell you of the six parts that they got that, you know, everyone loves them for and they made millions and millions of dollars for it. They could tell you there were 20 parts that they got rejected for, right? Exactly. So, so I think that it's important to know that this happens, uh, failure happens and rejection happens, but it makes us better. It makes us, it transforms us to be better people and then to work harder to have success. And I think that you just need to, you just need to look at it that way. This is just a part of life. Um, every, I mean, I can't think of anybody who has not been terminated at least once in their life, right? And, and <laughs> present, it, present company included, I too right. have been terminated more than once. Yes, and right. better for it. Yes, right. exactly, exactly. And 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 you know that has probably that termination has probably driven your success. Um, yeah. I can tell you, had I had that experience not happened to me, you know, back when I was third, fourth year associate, I don't think I would have a book of business today. Like that, yeah. that had to happen to me for me to realize what was important at a law firm and, and to under, really understand the business side of law firms and, yeah. and had that never happened to me, I wouldn't have had a book of business. I wouldn't be the managing partner of an office today. So it, um, that needed to happen. So, so I always tell associates this, who are, who've been laid off, who, uh, have had a setback or a failure, that failure needs to happen for your success later. It propels. Yeah. Success. So accept yes. it, accept it, and learn from it, and then grow from it and move past it. But you won't be successful without that failure. Amen. That's great. Well, thank you, Manita, for your time. Thank you for your honesty. Um, thank you for your experiences that you that you shared with our listeners today. They are. Um, valuable, and I know that our listening audience will find uh, what you've said very useful. I really sincerely appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Bouncing Back, Resilience for Lawyers. Join us next time for another story about thriving after overcoming challenges. You can find Bouncing Back and other programming for lawyers on MLA's Legal Talk Network.